I want to talk to you this morning about uh, an extremely important and influential free market economist who was also one of the great intellectuals of the 20th century. Uh, he was born into a Jewish family in New York City and educated in and around uh, New York. Uh, he attended Columbia University for his PhD where he studied, among others, with um, Arthur Burns, the influential American institutionalist who went on to be not only a Federal Reserve Chair, but also a Council of Economic Advisors Chair. Um, this, uh, this economist uh, was not only very accomplished in writing technical books and articles, but also was a great popularizer of free market ideas. His wife was an important intellectual in her own right, an accomplished professional, a great inspiration to him, as well as a uh, you know, life companion and helpmate. And uh, despite being extremely short of stature, this economist had a larger than life personality, uh, a great deal of personal charisma. Of course, I'm talking about Milton Friedman. <laughs> Oh, 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 wait, wait. You thought it was the other short New York Jewish economist, free market thinker whose name begins with M. Okay, yeah, sorry. I guess this is an Austrian conference, so I should have known that. No, I'm, uh, I'm actually not going to talk about Friedman's monetary theory, but instead I want to talk about what is one of my favorite Milton Friedman contributions is his article that was published in the New York Times Magazine in 1970 called The Social Responsibility of Business is to Increase Its Profits. Okay, uh, it's not a technical article, uh, but an extremely uh, influential one. Um, I, if you just look up on Google Scholar, uh, this article has uh, over 30,000 citations on Google Scholar, again, it's a New York Times article. By comparison, you know, Friedman and Schwartz mentioned earlier this morning, Monetary History of the United States has about 12,000 citations. His, uh, his uh, book on the consumption function for which he, which was part of the Nobel Prize citation, 12,000 citations. Uh, his methodology book, uh, 9,000 citations. So uh, the social responsibility of business piece may be Friedman's most influential and enduring contribution. The article was published in uh, 1970, so in uh, 2020 there were a number of special conferences and events and symposia to reflect upon and engage with and mostly disagree with Friedman's conclusions uh, in this article. Um, first thing to, 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 to discuss is what Friedman actually says and what he doesn't say. Right, so this sort of knee-jerk, superficial interpretation of Friedman's point that you often see in the media and so forth is that, you know, he's, Friedman is a champion of greed. He's saying that social responsibility isn't important and therefore it should be ignored by businesses and business leaders. That's not at all what the article claims, right? It's essentially an article about stewardship. Okay, his argument is that corporations are run on a day-to-day -day basis, not by their owners, but by hired managers. And when hired managers, the CEO, the executive team, when they spend corporate resources on you know, environmentalism or promoting DEI or whatever it would be, essentially they're spending someone else's money, they're spending other people's money, the shareholder's money, on activities that the shareholders may not support. Okay, in, in, in technical terms, it's a principal agent kind of argument. So Friedman doesn't say whether social responsibility per se is worthy or meritorious or should be pursued by organizations or not. He says corporations should engage in activities that are supported by their owners. And typically owners will prefer to increase their monetary profit will want the firm to increase its profit rather than pursue other objectives. Freeman says what, the, what corporations should do is you know, generate the highest possible returns to shareholders, pay those returns out to shareholders in the form of dividends, capital gains or buybacks, whatever, and then let the shareholders spend their money on whatever social causes they want. 
right? They can write a, write a check to Greenpeace, or hopefully they can give all of their money to the Mises Institute, <laughs> right? But it should be the owners making that decision themselves rather than hired managers making that decision for owners. And, you know, Friedman points out that, uh, you know, one of the reasons why corporations do, in fact, uh, de devote corporate resources to these non-financial objectives is because there's pressure from the legal and political environment or from the media, and they're responding to this external pressure. And so we would certainly want to take into account characteristics of the legal and regulatory. Uh, we want to take legal and regulatory conditions into account and sort of trying to explain changes in this sort of behavior over time. Well, I want to propose a, a, an update or a revision, a clarification, or I think an improvement to Friedman's article to shift the attention away from shareholders to owners more generally. So really the argument is about the owners of companies, the owners of firms, and what owners want. Now Friedman's argument is essentially saying that, look, the problem is a mismatch between the preferences of managers, right? And of course, the managers want to be featured on the, you know, on, on television and in the media. They want to be lauded for their, uh, they want to be praised for, you know, their environmental concern and caring about diversity and sustainability and inequality and whatever. Um, Friedman says, but the owners don't care about that. So there's a mismatch between the preferences of owners and the preferences of managers. But I think we can also talk about other owner capabilities, such as the owner's judgment under uncertainty, which is the function of ownership and entrepreneurship emphasized by Ludwig von Mises. Remember, in Mises' description of the entrepreneur, he says the real entrepreneur is a speculator, a man eager to utilize his opinion about the future structure of the market for business operations promising profits. He sees the past and the present as other people do, but he judges the future in a different way. So in Mises' theory, the owners of enterprises, those who have to make the ultimate decisions about how the enterprise's resources will be allocated under conditions of uncertainty, are performing this entrepreneurial function. They're exercising the residual judgment that is the ultimate feature uh, and that being in private hands is, for me, is the ultimate feature of a market economy. So uh, another way to think about the point raised by Friedman is the managers who are, not, who are ultimately stewards of somebody else's money, they are not in the position to exercise this kind of residual judgment because they're not the owners, right? They're the agents acting on behalf of someone else. I actually wrote an article a few years ago uh, elaborating on this point in the context of, of context of stakeholder theory as well as social responsibility, arguing that once we take Mises' idea of judgment under uncertainty into account, that strengthens the case that managers should not be making decisions that are contrary to the wishes of the owners of resources. Now, just to, to be complete, I mean, there's a sort of a, a technical response to the claim that, that, that people like, like me have made about this. That you, know, you could imagine, in theory, there could be a, a case where the, the owners actually do want you know, to protect the environment, or the owners do want to combat inequality, and, and it's more efficient for them to let the manager spend their money collectively on their behalf rather than have each of them, you know, spend their own money because there's sort of a scaling up effect from concentrating the action in the hands of the manager rather than letting everybody do it themselves. But that would be a rare special case, and we would have to know, we'd have to some way of know, have, have to have some way of knowing that this thing that the manager claims the owners all want is a thing that all the owners or the majority of the owners really do want. And of course, typically, we would have no way of knowing that. Um, so one of the things I like about this, you know, sort of shifting the focus from shareholders to owners is it helps to, it, it helps us to understand these debates that you see about Friedman's article and about, uh, uh, you know, shareholder governance and so-called stakeholder governance more generally is it's often framed as an issue of stakeholder supremacy, sorry, shareholder supremacy. Should shareholders be supreme 
like only the wishes of shareholders should matter, or should the firm take into account the interests of a broad set of stakeholders being defined as you know, workers and suppliers and customers and you know, people in the natural environment around where the company operates and so forth. So a lot of these, uh, this emphasis on stakeholder governance, governance that has really popped up in the last decade or so claims to take a broader and therefore more correct view of whose interests should matter rather than the narrow view that only shareholders are supreme. Discussions of corporate social responsibility or ESG investing or you know, woke capitalism are, are often you know, pitted, they pit stakeholders against shareholders. And, and when you say it that way, it sounds like, gee, it does seem odd that the shareholders should be supreme somehow. But from the point of view of Misesian and Rothbardian property rights theory, it's not the shareholders per se who are supreme. If anyone, it's the ownership group more generally, right? I mean, if I own a mom and pop store and then I hire a manager who operates the store in a way that's contrary to my wishes, well, I think that would strike all of us as some kind of a problem, right? It's my store, I own the store. In a sense, my decisions should carry more weight than those of an employee, right? So, but, but we never hear su supremacy critiqued in this more general way. Right, there are lots of ways to organize a company. Um, some firms are proprietorships with a single owner. Uh, firms are, can be partnerships with a set of partners, you know, a, a medical practice, for example, an investment firm. We have family companies in which family members uh, are owners of the assets. Firms can be organized as cooperatives. Right in agriculture, as, as Timothy, to use Timothy's example, we see you know, a lot of production uh, um, especially downstream of sort of producing commodities, uh, organized as, as co-ops. A grocery store could be a consumer's co-op, in which case the patrons of the firm, the, the workers or the customers or the suppliers, depending on how the co-op is structured, would be the owners. And of course, in a corporation, the owners are shareholders. So you, know, you never hear these stakeholder people complaining you know, worker-owned co-ops are bad because they ensconce a kind of worker supremacy, right? Or we shouldn't have partnerships because that's elevating partner supremacy over all of society. No, we all recognize that in a, co a worker-owned co-op, the workers are supreme. In a partnership, the partners are supreme. Okay, so if a corporation is just a firm in which the ownership is dispersed among a large number of individuals, and the shares can be traded publicly and so forth, then why would it be any different for them? Why, can share, why is it wrong for shareholders to be supreme in this particular organizational form when it's not wrong for proprietors to be supreme if the firm is organized according to a different kind of organizational structure? So let's change the framing from shareholder supremacy to owner supremacy. Okay, what are some implications of an owner supremacy view of the world? Well, first, we need to recognize that, that owners in general often do balance financial metrics like profit maximization or return on invested capital with non-financial metrics as well. And there's nothing strange or odd about that, right? Imagine, you know, imagine a technology startup company, you know, Apple of the 1970s. Well, the, 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 uh, the founders, the members of the founding team, yeah, I mean, probably they have dollar signs in their eyes at some point, but they're not doing it primarily for the money. It's the excitement, it's the thrill of working with these colleagues, it's the desire to solve some technical problem or to change the world. Um, you know, in a family business, uh, getting to work with family members or preserving the family name or being able to have employment opportunities for members of the family, children, grandchildren, etc. That may be an important objective of the venture as well as the sort of conventional financial measures. And again, that is the owner's privilege, right? Just as, as consumers, you know, as workers, I could choose a less lucrative but more personally rewarding job, like being a professor, for example. You know, if I weren't a professor, I would be probably Fortune 500 CEO, <laughs> maybe an elite investment banker, you know, the seven-figure salary, but I chose to give that up because I love students and I love hanging out with people like you, 
<laughs> and giving speeches. And you know, there's nothing wrong with that, right? It's a matter of personal preference. Likewise, an owner of a venture may say, look, I, I really care about this passion, and I know I'm, gonna make a, I'm probably going to make less money by pursuing the passion, but that's what I want to do. F fantastic, great. That's a matter of individual choice, right? Now, we need to recognize that you know what in the literature they call dual purpose firms. In other words, a firm pursuing multiple objectives, not only financial performance, but also one of these other objectives. Those ventures are often more difficult to manage, right? The performance measures are noisier and more complicated. It's hard to know whether you're hitting the target or not. There are other reasons why it can be more difficult to manage those firms, but there's no, you know, that's fine. Again, it's the, if, the, if the owners are willing to, to bear that cost, then you know, more power to them. We should also recognize that you know, uh, ownership is also sort of a skill or what some of my colleagues and I have called a competence. And some, some individuals and groups are more competent at owning than other groups. You can think of market competition as a means of you know, sort of sorting the more competent owners from the less competent owners. And uh, as the great uh, uh, legal scholar Henry Hansman has pointed out, uh, when, when ownership is uh, held by a group, groups that are relatively homogeneous in interest, on average, uh, do better, are higher in ownership competence than very heterogeneous groups. Right, so a challenge when you're pursuing not just financial metrics, but other metrics as well, is that not all of the owners may agree on what those other metrics should be and how things should be weighted or balanced. It's a lot easier if everyone only cares about making money. That's straightforward, there's an unambiguous measure, you don't have debates and disagreements about what the objective should be, which is why, as Hansman points out in his great book, Ownership of Enterprise, um, the most efficient, most valuable productive units in a modern economy tend to be corporations with dispersed ownership rather than co-ops and partnerships and proprietorships, even though those are, you know, we're happy for those to flourish as well, because you just you avoid most of these problems of collective action and disagreement when the owners, at least the majority of owners, only care about one thing, making money. Now, I just want to point out, um, you know, Mises, while emphasizing the owner's property rights, also stresses the influence of consumers in sort of guiding and shaping what owners can do. Uh, Mises, uh, building on work by William H. Hutt, uh, emphasizes the concept of consumer sovereignty, right? By which he means something like this. Here's a quote from Human Action. Mises says, the direction of all economic affairs is, in the market economy, a task of the entrepreneurs, owners in this case, right? Theirs is the control of production. They are at the helm. They steer the ship. A superficial observer would believe that they are supreme, but they are not. They are bound to obey unconditionally the captain's orders. The captain is the consumer. Okay. If a businessman does not, Mises goes on, if a businessman does not strictly obey the orders of the public as they are conveyed to him by the structure of market prices, he suffers losses, he goes bankrupt, and is thus removed from his eminent position at the helm. So, I mean, I, I, I certainly appreciate Mises' formulation here, and, and Mises is making the perfectly valid point that when owners or entrepreneurs are not satisfying the wishes of consumers, they will pay a very heavy price in the market. You know, we've seen a little bit of that just in the last year or two. You know, some people talk about a, you know, an anti-woke backlash, right? You know, companies like Bud Light and remember Gillette and their toxic masculinity ad. You know, these firms saw their sales plummet, their stock prices plummet. Some firms like, you know, Tractor Supply, why would they have a huge DEI office? Well, when it was revealed that they did, they walked it back and they said, we're getting rid of our DEI staff. A lot of universities are, um, uh, you know, changing or re relaxing their DEI requirements, shutting down their DEI departments, sometimes because of state legislation. Although, as one Jura pointed out, many times that's just a rebranding. They're sort of hiding the DEI function under another name. But, but I mean, clearly these examples suggest that, you know, there, if, if, the, if a company is doing something that's greatly at odds with what its consumers want, there's a great, you know, there's a risk, right? There's a risk of paying a heavy price uh, for doing that. 
I sort of prefer Rothbard's formulation of this concept. Rothbard says what prevails on the market is not consumer sovereignty per se, but individual sovereignty, meaning that consumers can choose to buy or not to buy. They can choose to patronize one seller or another. But, but owners can also choose to offer certain products or not. Owners can choose to make more money or to willingly accept the chance of making less money in exchange for doing something that they want to do that may go slightly against the interest of some consumers. So th I think the right way to think about it is not that the market is supreme over property holding entrepreneurs, but that the market, you know, it constrains the behavior. It puts a price on behavior of owners in pursuing some objectives other than profit maximization or value max maximization. They can do it if they want, but the, at, you know, at some point you may, you may run out of capital or resources because no one is willing to pay a price for your product. Okay, so going back to Friedman, I was too lazy to, to, to copy and paste the quote, so I just got one of these meme thingies. But, uh, you know, like a, a sort of a, a key takeaway from Friedman's article that is widely quoted is, is the, the claim that, you know, there's only one, there's one and only one responsibility of business to use its resources and engage in activities designed to increase its profits so long as it stays within the rules of the game. I would like to modify this statement slightly in the following way. I would say the social responsibility of business is to use its resources, engage in activities designed to do whatever the owners want, so long as it stays within the rules of the game, for us, meaning you know, doesn't violate the rights of person or property, doesn't violate libertarian property, uh, doesn't violate libertarian rights. Now for publicly traded corporations, you know, what the owners want, the owner's objective, is very likely to be, in almost all cases, will be earning the highest possible return on their invested capital. Okay, like I said, there may be some exceptions. Those are likely to be rare. And, you know, it's also unlikely that hired managers will be able to discern an aggregate collective objective of the owners. Again, we're talking about corporations here that is something other than maximizing the return on invested capital. And, you know, even if they could, they need to make sure owners recognize that pursuing something other than financial performance tends to not work very well, you know, for reasons that I explained before. And of course, attempts by the state to coerce corporations or any kind of firm, right, to pursue an objective other than the owner's objective, right, compelling through, this, through state action, owners of firms to do something other than what owners want is, of course, a violation of the owner's property rights and is unjust from that point of view, but is also likely to create economic inefficiency, right? So in the free market, owner supremacy is where it's at. Owner supremacy rules and should rule. Thank you. <laughs>